I'm Aubrey Sidderson, and this is Scald. You're listening to a single chapter of my ongoing sword and sorcery serial. I write a new one every single week, without fail, and then I record it in one single, flawless take. It picks up right where we left off last time. So if this is your first episode and you want to know exactly what's going on, you might want to start back at the beginning. It's totally up to you, though. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, Part 28. She stood panting as a grin crawled slowly, tentatively, across her face. Her chest heaving underneath her thin, threadbare garment, she looked out toward the horizon, the jagged edge of that rocky tundra, that barren, blasted terrain. She sighed, and she looked out, as she did every morning, looked out at that weak, dim sun pulling itself up into the sky. She'd succeeded, made it through another night, another torturous, exhausting, 20-hour night. Another night spent defending the tower, her tower, flinging flaming death and scorching hellfire down upon all those who would oppose her, those who would tear down everything good in this world, those who would destroy everything worth defending, those foul, nescient, green monsters. She'd succeeded, not in any large-scale goal or epic quest, but succeeded in making it through the night. And for now, that was enough. It would always have to be enough because it's all that she had, all she would ever have, the life she was damned to, the excruciating existence that the fates had condemned her to suffer until she drew her final breath and the tower was overrun. Even if she succeeded in life, She would fail in death. The present was all she had, and for a brief moment, it was enough. She leaned out the window, spoiling herself, allowing her pallid face a brief bit of what passed for sunshine on that darkened world, a brief bit of sunshine before collapsing into bed, falling immediately to sleep so as to make the most of her world's meager four-hour days. She shut her eyes briefly, imagining that she felt the rays of the sun warming her face. But she knew it was impossible Her world had been abandoned by the sun, that shameful, impotent star, just as sense, as logic, as intelligence, had been abandoned by the trolls. The trolls. Her eyes shot open, her teeth clenched, and her upper lip rose in a hateful sneer. The trolls. The simple thought of them filled her with disgust, disgust so potent, so virile, they could only be burned away by one thing, the cleansing fire of hate, rage. She turned her gaze downward to the blasted tundra surrounding the tower, and she looked down at the troll horde, that endless wave of puffy, bloated green flesh, frantic to return to their caves and the darkness within. She scowled, a reflexive growl rising in her throat, watching in disgust as the trolls scattered and scrambled without even the pretense of order or discipline, pushing, shoving, climbing over one another, fighting one another in their desperate retreat. Just as they had done the morning before, and the morning before that, and as they would do every morning, until the tower was gone, torn down, destroyed, reduced to useless rubble, and scattered across that dismal landscape. 
She had succeeded as much as she ever could in this endlessly repeating nightmare. But suddenly, she wanted more. She didn't just want to rout the trolls. She wanted to defeat them. Send them scurrying back to their caves? No, she would fill their caves with flame. Cleansing, beautiful, hateful, cathartic flame. Let their flesh burn, bubble, and boil. Let thick, acrid smoke pour out from their holes. Let their screams echo across that dying world. The sun, that useless sun, offensive in its futility. What good had it done her? What good had it really done her? None. Nothing. It had done nothing. So why not do the job that the sun should have done, should have been capable of? Why not set the trolls alight, turn their caves to ovens, roast them alive, cackling at their horrible, nescient screams as the smoke, black and heavy with the boiling fat of those ignorant beasts, as the smoke rises up, fills the sky, and blots out that useless star. Why should she be damned to simply wait in the tower, to steal a few hours of sleep and wait for the trolls, to stand idly by and wait for them to march on her tower once again? She should be marching on them. She had the power. She commanded the flame, the hungry, licking flame, and she could use it to put an end to the trolls. She would either succeed, filling the landscape with charred bones and liquefied flesh, or she would fail, and the trolls would tear her limb from limb, just as they were bound to do, as they were destined to do, sooner or later. She looked out at that diseased, disintegrating world, one where light had receded into darkness, where the sharp edge of knowledge had been broken by the blunt repetition of ignorance, where Entropy had taken its revered place in the pantheon of universal forces, and she knew, she knew that she could destroy the trolls. It wouldn't even take long. She could leave the tower. She could pursue the trolls. She could dart after that foul mass of green flesh, and she could, she would see them burn. She could leave the tower unguarded. Just for a day, for a single, laughably short, four-hour day. Leave it unguarded as she did what needed to be done, what must be done. For how long could she be expected to simply act defensively? When was it time to attack, to strike back? When was it her turn to rampage through the tundra, to tear through the troll horde, to decimate their people, to tear down what they had constructed, to cast all that lay before her into rubble? When was it her turn? Now. Now, she lowered her head and raised her hands, and as her fury came to a rolling boil, so too did the pot at the center of the room. The air changed suddenly. It caught a light. It became alive. The air of that dying world was brought back to life in a way that it hadn't been in ages, in millennia, for who knows how long. The sun wouldn't shine, wouldn't do what needed to be done, then she would do it. She would set the entire world aflame, would burn it to cinders, and she would stand in the ashes, laughing. The boiling pot burst into flames. The ancient stone tower creaked, unaccustomed to the vitality that filled the air. And as they scrambled back to their holes, men, women, and children, the trolls, those foolish Bestial monsters, worse than beasts, because they chose their ignorance, chose to be blunt instruments of destruction and nothing more, chose to destroy the very foundations upon which they stood. Those imbecilic monsters, they looked to the sky, slack-jawed, mouths agape with nothing but ignorance in their eyes and jealousy in their hearts. They looked to the skies above, and they knew fear. But as that furious figure, the rage-filled guardian of the tower, as she raised her eyes, the twin globes filled with a fire brighter than that dark world had known in generations. As she raised her eyes, 
She saw something that made her stop suddenly, horrified. Her arm, her right arm. The arm that had bothered her the night before, the one that had given her pause, the one that refused to move, that refused to obey, that refused to do its duty in defense of the tower, the one that she had failed to motivate, that began to work only under the influence of rage and hate. Now, with her thin, threadbare sleeve hanging down, bunched at her elbow, her right forearm was revealed, and suddenly she understood. It all made sense. She let out a howl, an agonized cry that bounced off the stone tower, magnifying itself, filling the dawn landscape and further hastening the trolls in their daily retreat. She looked at her arm and let out another cry because her right arm, her pale skin, her pallid flesh now displayed a patch of green that stiffened and burned in the growing sunlight. It had happened again. She had been taken, infected, corrupted once again, and worst of all, she had allowed it. The green, the ignorant, mindless green was powerful, was contagious, could devour a world in less than a day, but that world and those it devoured must be willing. She had allowed it to take root, to find a home within her, and she had almost allowed it to take her completely. She had almost abandoned her post, her mission, her sworn duty, and for what? Momentary pleasure, vengeance, the fleeting joy of mindless destruction, her heart filled with hate. Once again, but this time, it was directed inward. She turned from the window, laughing sardonically. Do what must be done. Do what must be done. She repeated it over and over, changing the intonation, the emphasis, over and over again. But no matter how she said it, no matter how she phrased the question, she knew the answer. Do what must be done. Tears welled up in her eyes. Best to get it over with. Best to do it quickly, before she had time to change her mind, before she had time to regret, before she allowed the corruption another opening, another opportunity. She walked to the center of the room, to the boiling pot, to the fire that still reached up out of it. Do what must be done. She laughed, and she shoved her right arm into the flames. Maul struck Xylan, hard and fast, the back of his fist smashing into the godless monk's gaping mouth mid-cackle. The laughter stopped with the crack of the blow, and the godless monk crumpled to the ground. Xylan had been changed, but not so much that he could withstand a blow from the one true king of men. Enough! Stop laughing! Maul didn't understand what was going on, didn't know what he should do, and as he always did when he was confused, he raged, taking his fury out on the closest thing to him. As Zylan suppressed his laughter, wiping the blood from his lips, Maul turned back to the source of his confusion, the catalyst for his rage. The young New halfling huntmaster, his two younger assistants, and the two even younger girls they held in their custody. Maul's harem, the overjoyed Belbricks, and the horrified, panicked Suana. Maul, Maul, my king, please don't let them take us, please. Suana begged. She pleaded for mercy, terrified of what the hunters had planned for her and Belbricks, for Maul's harem, for the stone god's sacrifice. 
Maul gathered himself together enough to address those present in the smoky longhouse, to address them in the regal, unforgiving tone of his ancestors. Stop! What is all of this? What are you doing with my girls? The young huntmaster was confused, but did his best to answer his fearsome god king. Why, we're, we're, we're taking the god king's sacrifice. Why must the god king's sacrifice be taken from me? Why not take it from his harem, the stone god's harem? Take it from him. The huntmaster smiled cleverly, proud to know the answer. He believed that he was being tested, a savage catechism conducted by one touched by the divine. Because this is his harem, my king. It is his because it is yours, because it belongs to his avatar. It also belongs to him. Suana was overcome with tears, and if not for the nervous-looking hunter holding her up, she would have collapsed on the floor. Maul watched, silent but for a moment, taking in the scene. He saw past the huntmaster, saw past his hunters, and he saw the girl, Suana, overtaken with fear, with pain, with agony, and worst of all, with hopelessness. Her body, her mind, her soul was racked not by the presence of something, but by its absence. As the flames needed fuel to burn, so too did a soul need hope. And before his eyes, Maul saw Suana's soul dwindle and flicker. It was a sight he was well familiar with, a sight that he had not just seen, but lived. A small boy, the small human boy, dragged from the one he loved, the one he desired above all else, dragged away by guards not unlike these, confused, unwilling to understand, to think, to make a choice, only doing what they were told, only doing what they must. Dragging the boy to the world tree, stringing him up, tying him to those mighty branches, leaving him for dead, but for worse than that, leaving him exposed, leaving the only thing he had left, his hope, to dry up, crumble, and be blown away in the wind. And so it was, and so it had been. He had lost hope, but in its place, something else had grown. It was a sight he was well familiar with, a sight that had been seared, into his brain, the young girl, the elven girl, the royal elven girl, down on her knees, pleading, begging. His maul stood above, his face a mask of hate, rage, and confusion, frozen in time, watching as her knees hit the floor, as her tears hit the floor, as she pounded on the floor, screaming for mercy, for help, for divine intervention, screaming for anything, anyone to come down and replace the hope that had fled from her body. And as she wailed, eyes clenched shut, kneeling in the gore of the royal family who had gone first, the royal family that Maul had taken first, the one true king of men stood above her, cudgel raised high. The blood ran down that makeshift club, creating rivers and inlets and coagulating lakes in the grooves of that knotted wood. The blood ran down and it stained Maul's hands. The blood that would not could not wash off. And as gore poured down the club, as hope poured out of the girl, a thick dark stream of blood poured from Maul's nose. The savage brute shook his head, hoping to rattle the pieces of his shattered psyche into place, hoping to somehow make sense of it all. Where he'd been, what he'd done, and most horrifyingly, what he must do, still. Maul mumbled to himself, Do what must be done. Over and over again, Do what must be done, do what must be done. But each time he said it, 
He heard it in a different voice. His own, that of the dream hermit Traum, and someone else's, a woman's. His maul mumbled, eyes glazed over. The halfling stared on in terror, transfixed by the no doubt divinely inspired fugue state into which their god king had fallen. The godless monk, however, was not so impressed and began to laugh again, this time in disbelief. When he reckoned that Maul's mumblings had gone on long enough, Xylan laid a calming hand upon the brute's shoulder. Though the godless monk had been changed, he still retained the powers of his former order. With a start, with the strains of his ceaseless refrain still echoing in his ears, Maul snapped back into consciousness. As understanding returned to his rage-filled gaze, Maul wiped the blood from his face, cringing as he bumped against his tender, swollen eye. Masochistically, he prodded the red, inflamed skin, wincing as his brain flooded with the mental clarity that a sharp pain can bring. Snorting, Relishing the hot iron taste of blood, the taste that had driven far better men to far worse. Maul let his decision sit, festering inside him. And then, when he was ready, he spoke it aloud. Very well. Take your sacrifice. Do what must be done. Maul, avoiding the shocked, petrified stares of Suana, pointed his cudgel at the now stoic Huntmaster. But you will return with meat enough for my army to take Ravenna. The young halfling hunters went to usher the girls out the door, but with Belbricks they needed no help. She was elated, tears of joy running down her face, ecstatic for any opportunity. To serve her god king. Such was not the case, however, with Suana, who once again cried out to Maul, appealing to a sense of mercy, of empathy, of decency that was not there. Maul, please, my king, I could be so much more than this, could do so much more. I could help you. Did I not advise you? Did I not serve you well? I gave you everything you needed. Suana did her best to compose herself. Is this it? Is this it? Is this all you want from me? Am I nothing but livestock? A beast for a sacrifice? Is that all I am to you? Maul gritted his teeth. The sharp, broken fragments of his psyche digging into his mind. The pain was excruciating, but he chased it away with the one thing that always worked. Rage. His eyes shot back open, pupils of fire, and he growled. No. You're even less. Livestock. I could eat. Now go. Get her out of here. Speech left Suana as she fell catatonic, limp in the arms of the hunter who dragged her toward the door. Meanwhile, Belbrick squealed with delight, a joyous celebration of her life's faded climax. The stone god be praised! The stone god be praised! All thanks and glory to the stone god! Maul turned back to his throne as Xylan emitted that disconcerting laugh, the one that he had learned in the witch doctor's hut, the one that came with its change. No, <laughs> there's no God here, girl. Only man. Before Maul could reach his throne, before he could reach the massive granite throne that beckoned to him from across the longhouse, the new hunt master called to him. I'm sorry, my king. 
The witch doctor said that the Avatar, for, for a hunt of this magnitude, with, with this much at stake, they said that you must preside over the sacrifice. Maul squeezed his head in his hands, hoping to stop the throbbing as pressure might staunch a wound. But it was no use. And what if I don't? The huntmaster swallowed hard. They said that if you don't, my king, then the hunt will be no more successful than before. Maul slowly put away that long, twisting alabaster horn. He hid his prize within his leathers and he took up his cudgel, that preternaturally strong branch of the world tree, burnt and blackened by the stone god's flames. He groaned, and though it pained him, he reluctantly assented, agreed to once again watch a girl, no more than a child, cry, suffer, and die for the greater good. And why? Because it must be done. With Xylan by his side, with the faithful, unjudging cat beast Skog trailing close behind, Maul followed them out of the longhouse. He stood by and watched, emotionless, as the hunters ushered the girls toward an ancient stone altar covered in sickening crimson stains. Elbrix went willingly, but Suana was frozen, her face twisted into a harrowing mask of terror. As the hunters tied the girls to that macabre altar, a group of halfling men wheeled their stone god into place, looming over the altar with his massive jaws gaping open, obscenely. Xylan went to the girls and shared a few words, too low and soft for Maul and the rest of the crowd to make out. Whatever the godless monk told Belbrix, it must have delighted her, as the simple girl began to giggle and squirm, as if tickled by the rough ropes on her wrists and ankles. Suana, shockingly, also began to laugh as Xylan's words hoisted her up out of her trance. But her laugh wasn't one of delight. As she stole a glance back at Maul, her god-king, the one who had forsaken her, she shook her head and laughed the laugh of the condemned, not at peace with her death, but now fully aware that it was, without a doubt, her destiny. As the halfling men began to climb the stone god, passing that mystic catalyst up his body, passing the divine sustenance to be shoved inside the statue's mouth and set alight, Xylan made his way back to Maul. The godless monk made eye contact with the brute and shook his head, unable to stifle the grim, sardonic laughter that rose up from deep within the godless monk, bubbling to the surface of its own caustic accord. After all this, how you can still believe in gods beyond me. Halflings watched their god-king carefully. The stone god's mouth was full. The torch was lit. All that remained was to touch the one to the other, to allow the stone god to have his sacrifice, to give him what he wanted, what he deserved, what was already his. And all the halflings needed was word from the stone god's avatar, their god king, the one true king of men, Maul, who stood, mouth open, eyes glaring, caught and held by indecision, caught between what he knew was his and what he must do to take it. But before the savage could say a word, the village filled with agonized, tormented screams, horrible sounds that, though clearly emitted by halfling throats, contained something unnatural, something abhorrent, something that should not be. Maul turned, 
grateful for the distraction, for the postponement of the macabre decision that he knew he must make. And when he turned, he was confronted by a band of halfling warriors, clothing rent, skin torn, weapons lost, eyes glazed over in dread and dismay. My king, my king, help us, please, that, that, that thing, it comes. Maul scowled, knitted his brows. What? Speak plainly. What thing? What are you craven beasts running from now? But before they could answer, Maul saw it for himself. He saw the sky darken around it. He saw the world shatter in its presence. He saw it climb the hill leading to the village center. But it didn't climb. No, it didn't climb. Not really. It oozed. It undulated. It moved in ways that defied explanation. That blasted mortal minds with terror. That struck the soul with indescribable profanity. That issued an obscene plea when it whispered. But that still managed to reach the ears of all those in the village. I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry. As Skog cowered and growled, the hair standing up on her back, Maul began to bark orders. He commanded the savage halfling still present, the ones that hadn't succumbed to the to the thing's terror, the ones that hadn't fallen to the ground in quivering heaps. He commanded them to take up arms, to fight the horror, to drive it back to wherever it came from. But as the halflings leapt into action, as Xylan, the laughing, godless monk, stood by, uncharacteristically quiet, Maul knew how pointless, how futile the halfling's assault would be. Though he had never seen the monster, though he had never heard tale of it, though he knew nothing about it, he knew the name. He knew the horrible, spine-chilling name and all that it entailed. Deep inside, climbing out of ancestral memories older than time, the name stroked primal, ancient fears he didn't even know he had. Frozen in place, Maul shivered. And though it filled him with terror, he spoke the name. The Feldron. If you're digging Scald, please leave a good review on iTunes. It helps other people find the podcast. And if you leave a good one, I'll read it on the show. You don't have to write anything big or super long either. Just do like my pal Valiant Ville, who gave the show five stars and said, Blown away. Brilliant storytelling. Right now, over on Amazon, the Scald Volume 1 ebook is available for only $2.99. It's possible that you got it for free during the promotion I did, and if so, or even if you didn't, please go leave it a good review. Good reviews are the only way for self-published books to stand out on Amazon, so I really need your help. As always, though, if you really dig Scald and you really want to help out, please consider donating to the Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash scald. One dollar a month is only a quarter per episode. I am all over the internet. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr, they're all Aubrey Citizen. Super easy. Or head over to aubreycitizen.com, where I have links to everything, including Scald, the Scald ebook, my comics writing work, my wrestling talk show Straight Shoot, bio, contact information, all of my social media, and more. This week's recommendation is Ghost, known to some as Ghost BC, and their newish album, Meliora. It's difficult to pronounce. I took a minute. They're an awesome band, though, with a great aesthetic. Even if you're not big into metal, do not be turned off by all the hooded cloaks and corpse paint and macabre imagery. Because the actual music is more like the Beach Boys. But instead of cars, girls, and surfing, they sing about the devil, Lucifer, and Satan. All three of their albums are amazing and super catchy, including this newest one. Go check it out. Thanks for listening. I'll talk at you next week.